find uh, some expert as a chief negotiation officer. Uh, we're gonna ha- we're gonna have these lives on a regular basis, so uh, hopefully you're gonna like them. And uh, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a diversion from from what we usually do on this channel, but we're gonna develop this uh, we're gonna develop this branch as well. And there's gonna be a lot of negotiation related con- content on this channel. Uh, Daryl, hello. Hey, uh, Alex. Good to Great have to you here. here. How's uh, so, Daryl? Just uh, whilst we are uh, warming up, uh, yeah. so uh, tell the audience where are you ba- where where you're based. Uh, okay, so for those of you that haven't joined one of my um, webinars or lives with Alex before, so I'm actually based out of Israel, just outside of Tel Aviv. So I enjoy good weather <laughs> throughout the year. Um, I live 15 minutes from the beach. So nice. I I try I try to get down to the beach at least at least once a week, spend mm. uh, two three hours walking, uh, running, exercising. You know, you know, it's one of my loves, um, and that's what really what uh, you know, helps me energize, refill my battery, so to say. So um, I can't complain. Live in a beautiful area just outside of Tel Aviv. Nice. And yourself, Alex? Where do you um, does everyone well, I- know where uh, you are? I, I'm in Gloucestershire in the UK, so so uh, I live in uh, I, I live around Stroud, which is a very hilly area. Uh, I mean, very for England, which is predominantly flat, uh, and and it's it's a beautiful area. I really enjoy it every day. Every day, I I, I thank God that I'm here. So it's green, yeah, isn't it? It's very green. It is. Yeah, well, the, well, the, the whole. I, I think I think English people are very. Uh, lucky uh because they they were given everything i know greenery good soil uh mineral resources Th- yeah. that that's why that's why this country was actually overtaking many many other countries in in the industrial revolution because everything was just you know below b- below the feet uh yeah uh well, that's a good all... place to be so we don't have much green in summer hmm. everything goes brown because it's so hot and we get rain only in winter, so we don't have rain all year uh, around. Mm-hmm. But again, you know, we have our benefits: two hours to the north, and um, got lakes and just beautiful streams. And the two hours to the south, got a desert. So, and fifteen minutes away, I've got a beach. So, small country, I can't complain. I've got a nice diversity of uh, climate and scenery. <laughs> Let me check if we are live on YouTube, actually, just okay. just in case before we actually join to uh, go to uh, uh, full on uh, live discussing uh, remote negotiation strategies, uh, negotiating via Zoom and Teams and whatnot. Yeah, so uh, what an so- exciting, um, I don't know, 60 to 90 minutes, depending on the interactivity with the a team and with the and with the participants and the questions that are coming in. So so it's really, you know, I can, I can, I can, you know, I'm here for um, for everyone that's joined this live. Um, I can answer any questions when we finish about negotiations in general. And I'll love to take questions as we go through the presentation. So let's make it as interactive as possible. Alex, you stop me if there's any um, questions that come through. Just pause. And uh, and I'll happy to answer anything that comes through. And just like try and have a nice conversation uh, with the participants. We'll do yes. And and uh, whilst you're joining, please say hello. Please tell us where you're from, what you, what brought you here, why why you're so interested in in remote negotiations. Because we uh, we are a, a YouTube channel that talks about managing software vendors and predominantly Microsoft. But as far as I understand, Daryl, the techniques that you're going to talk about today. Do they apply to any sort of remote negotiation? So I'm actually going to be talking about, I would say, you know, on one hand, a methodology and process and best practices that you can apply to any negotiation. Um, yeah. Doesn't matter if it's software, hardware, or um, I don't know if you're buying, um, um, if it's a retail uh, um, transaction that you're doing globally. It's it's really the same same foundation that that apply. 
Um, what I'm going to do today, of course, I'm going to make it relevant to the Microsoft and to the software uh, procurement world in general, as the channel is about software. Um, just so everybody, um, just for everybody on the on the on the call today. So I have a complete end-to-end -end negotiation training called the Resilient Negotiator. And uh, it's also a free of charge part of what we do here and, and giving back to this um, uh, um, community. And this module specifically is, has always been one of the top modules that people come back again and again. So looking at what we thought would be the most relevant in this, I don't know, I don't know how to put it um, um, in, in better words, crazy times um, with COVID and, uh, and, and travel restrictions and uh, restrictions on, on, on actually um, reaching your workplace. Things have really, really changed drastically. Uh, and there's nothing more up to date, more, more, more relevant than tweaking, I would say, you know, just taking your negotiation abilities to the next stage. You don't have to apply everything we're going to go through today. If you take two, three techniques and tools that we're mm -hmm. going to talk about, that will help you take your, just notch up your negotiation ability. And when you notch up your negotiation ability, you improve the bottom line. So it doesn't matter if you're in procurement and you want to um, 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 uh, decrease the bottom line for your company or you're in sales, you want to increase just notching it up by even a percentage or two, that can make a very big difference when you're negotiating multiple agreements around um, throughout the year. So, so Alex. Um, yeah, I just, wanna say, I just, just want to say yeah. uh, hello to Robert and Nagaraj who, uh, 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 who sent their hellos into the chat. So, so thank you for being with us. And also uh, thanks for this one. Uh, you people are doing a great job. I really appreciate it. And, you know, I hope more people will join us and watch us. And if you like this uh, live during the live, click like, please, because that's what helps other people to uh, to uh, discover this video and to learn as well. So, so Alex, very are, we, are we good to go? Yeah, we're good to go. So just uh, let, let's do like 20 second introduction of, you know, you and me. Okay, so I see that my picture's up first, so I'm going to start. Um, I'm the Chief Negotiation Officer and a partner uh, with uh, Sam Expert as of last week. So yes. um, Alex and I have joined forces and bringing our, each one's bringing 20 plus years of experience in the software industry to the table for the benefit of our community. I'm, um, I was the founder and uh, manager of Emerset. Um, a global software asset management company uh, in the past, worked for Microsoft. I've gone through multiple sales roles, licensing executive roles, managed the global business. Um, I negotiate on behalf of very large organizations, Fortune 100 organizations, uh, software deals, hardware deals. So a lot of experience in that specific area. And of course, Microsoft is my sweet spot as well. So I'm going to put everything together. And Alex always puts up um, the book that I wrote uh, seven years ago regarding negotiating with Microsoft. So thank you, Alex, for sharing that with the, with the community as well. Hopefully, when uh, we have time, we will have another book coming out. Uh, so I don't know, if the community wants to hear more or see a book come out, it's a lot of work, a lot of effort. but um, we would love to hear from you if that's something that you'd like us to uh, put together for the benefit of everyone. Um, so it's really up to the community to to request us to get that done. So okay. yeah, thanks, Alex. For that thanks, Daryl. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I won't I, I won't spend that much time. It's just you know if you if you're on this channel for the first time, yeah. I founded this channel. You can discover what I'm you know stand for, what I'm all about just by watching videos on this channel. If you you can subscribe. We, we don't we don't really ask for subscriptions. We only ask people to genuinely either like or dislike the video if they either like it or dislike it. Uh, but if you if you enjoy it, by all means, welcome to the community. We have a lot of interaction. We ask the community what you want to talk about, and then we uh, release videos on those topics. So, and and 
I don't know if you know uh, that we also run on this channel. We run a free Microsoft licensing license management training, and they're not. Uh, they're eight separate parts, not the same thing. Separate parts, and the next one is on the first of uh, September, which is next uh, week, same time, yeah. s- same same day of week. So you can follow us uh, either on LinkedIn or here, uh, and y- we we post all the YouTube co- almost all the YouTube content on uh, LinkedIn, uh, also adding some textual posts, news, discussions. So you're welcome to follow us wh- whatever. And if you're a company that requires, that has any Microsoft licensing headache, just give us a, you know, give us a nudge and we'll jump on the call. Usually it takes 30 minutes to get you, you take your headache away and then plan, plan the actions that, you know, you need to do. And if we can help you, this is what we do. Uh, so yeah, moving on, uh, to Daryl's, uh, what we're going to cover Na- now. So what we're going to cover. So we've got quite a bit of material to cover today. We're going to start off with, um, email negotiation. So really, um, remote negotiations is a three piece. Well, there are three pieces to remote negotiations. There's email negotiations, there's voice. And of course there's video that we've all, let's call it. Zoom fatigue or, or, or Teams, whatever you want to call it, it's the equivalent, so to say, we'll talk about what the differences are of a face-to-face uh, negotiation. So basically, remote negotiations, three pieces, email, phone, and, um, and uh, uh, well, not face-to-face, I keep coming back to face-to-face, but video conferencing. So when we're looking at where at where we want to be with negotiations, if we move forward, Alex, um, basically, ultimately, it's not one or the other. It's not email or video conferencing. And that's where I think many times I would say that there's a misconception or there are mistakes made, made where individuals think that the remote negotiations actually only start when you have that video conference and they neglect the entire process or rapport building and foundational building of the negotiations that really start with that first email that goes out. And once that first email goes out, that's when the negotiation actually starts. And that's where you've already set the tone for the negotiation. And there's a saying, uh, 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 what's the saying when you get arrested? Anything you say will and can be used against you, if I'm getting the phrase correct. Yeah. That's what happens in negotiation. Once you start um, emailing, that's it. It's going to come back to you. So, 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 so just keep in mind, remote negotiations are not only video conferencing or, have, or not even having a, just a, um, a regular call. A uh, 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 either phone call or a or a internet call, but but really it all starts with email, and then it's a combination at the end of the day. It's all three of them that that come together as as the basis for remote negotiations. And you know, if we were in regular times, I would say most negotiations today start remotely, and then they move on to face to face. But many other negotiations end remotely. So let's just look at the, let's call them what I call them, the 12 rules of email negotiation. So we're going to go through each one of them. I'm going to give you the sequence of how to start off with email negotiations. And then when, to my opinion, is the right time to move on. You always go back and forth, but, but there's like a sequence. And then how do you move on to the final stages? So let's just take a quick view um, of the 12 rules of email negotiation. So first of all, what I'm going to say here shouldn't shock you, but it's very much like meeting somebody in person. It's keeping to the same rules, but making sure you get them right as you hit the road, as you start off the negotiation. So that's why I'm saying email is already negotiations. So first of all, be strategic, detailed oriented, very, very important. Whatever you say, you need to detail it. Don't just generalize it. Make sure you get everything down really, really well. 
your standards when 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 you have a position that you want to back up it's easier especially in email to back it up with market standards because you don't have that face to face discussion you can't feel what the other side is saying you can't maneuver and be agile so back up all of your positions your requests if you can of course with market standards being um procurement bi information market information peer information if you can very very important one of the things people get lost with um email negotiations is attachments so of course you at ultimately you need the contracts to be attached and paperwork and so on but try keep the initial sequence with non let's call it non attachments try keep your requirements and your needs in an email and don't send people to multiple documents you can get lost and it can get pretty messy Uh, that's that that's that I yeah. can I I can add to that sometimes attachments can't be opened properly on uh especially Android phones uh well I, iOS has the same issue so they may be miss you know different the format will not be exactly how you put it together unless it's a PDF and then honestly reading the PDF from this size of screen is impossible and I use a smaller yeah. version as well of an iPhone so yeah well that's and, that And if you think about Microsoft, let's just think about Microsoft a second Alex. Microsoft if you look at their contractual agreements, you know, if you if you're looking at an EA and mm-hmm. and now you need to start negotiating on that EA agreement and you're going back and forth. Of course you want to start redlining that agreement at at a certain time. But imagine now you're starting to write your requirement document within that EA that has multiple attachments and now you need to reference each each one, send it over and then start opening it up and it gets a mess it's easier just to take the relevant sections that you want to discuss break it up of course you can't do everything at once and you need to start breaking it up and then moving forward so 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 what i always suggest is to segment um um the uh, details that you want to convey in an email and again bring them into the email and don't leave them in attachment um very important you know we talked about Uh, well we talked offline about um your posture and how you come through your tone of voice comes through in an email you might not realize it or you or you realize it but but you don't pay attention to it if you're angry or you're upset you're tired you've had a bad day it will come through in the way that you write your language and not only that there are huge culture differences we'll talk a bit about culture differences i've got a full module on that but in different cultures being if you are in germany and i'm in israel or um alex is in uh, the uk and we say something in an email it's going to come through completely different when the other side reads it so i always say be as business like as you need, as you can in an email don't use standard day to day um language don't try and be funny don't try and don't 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 bring your current exact experience you really need to be business orientated and business detailed otherwise the other side and you won't even know it might get offended he'll feel something that you might have wanted to convey or you might have not wanted to convey but again you don't know how that person is going to read through it of course don't lie be credible especially in emails emails i don't have to tell you we've all seen emails where they start and then you never know where they end off um and the, and it will come back to haunt you so 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 what i'm saying in lying or or credibility it's one thing to try and play a game in fr- in facial negotiations front to front negotiations because nobody hopefully is not recording you in an email it's already recorded and it will come back to haunt you to go to your managers to go to your peers credibility is i would say the number one um virtue that you need to bring to email negotiations don't forget that email negotiations are asynchronic um what it means is basically that it's not immediate you send an email you need to wait for a reply you need to be patient you need mm-hmm. to be strategic in your thinking so so when you send an email and you anticipate an answer after 24 hours 48 hours and you don't receive an answer you need to be patient you need to wait You don't want to show anxiety. You don't want to show that you're under pressure. 
there are, again, there are countries, geographies, where they take longer to reply. That if they didn't reply, it doesn't mean they haven't received or they're not dealing with your email. They, they just don't have the need to let you know that they're dealing with it because in their culture, I received the email, then you should know that I'm taking you seriously. So you need to, be, you need to think about when you're going to go back to them at the intervals. And one of the solutions to that, not being in the dark, when you start sending an email and you're waiting for a reply and, oh, well, it's not coming and, you know, you're getting all apprehensive and so on and you're looking at your watch and looking at your, at your phone, uh, especially in an organization like Microsoft where things need to go up the chain of command um, with larger requirements. And, you know, there's a whole process within Microsoft. You start off with your account rep and then it goes up to his manager and his manager goes up to a director and then it goes to the licensing business desk. And if it's a serious, serious uh, deal, then it might go up to a um, 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 executive sponsor. And then all that takes time. So if you are in doubt regarding the response time, I recommend actually just noting there, putting it out there saying, um, if it would be possible, please provide me an answer, um, um, a, a, rep not an answer, a reply um, of the status within the next, two days, if possible, as I need to report back to my I manager. Good one. I like that, yeah. Okay, so then take out that doubt and put in something that you expect to receive a notice, even if it's in process, because otherwise you are the one that's sitting there and uh, really anxious, chewing your pen. I don't know what you do when you, um, when you get anxious, but, but take that uh, anxiety um, off the table very, very quickly. Uh, now, okay, facts are very similar. Use facts to back your asks, very similar to, um, to uh, positions and standards. Again, facts could be um, if you have an ask for an extension of your um, audit clause. So you've got a 30-day, standard 30-day um, uh, audit clause in your agreement, but previously... No, sorry, sorry, the standard is 30 days. And Microsoft's come back and, all, and said, okay, we're going to a new agreement and it's going to be 30 days. But you look in your previous agreement and your predecessor actually negotiated a 45-day grace period. So, so don't just ask for 45 days. You know, a trivial example, use that document or that um, previous win as your baseline. So again, use facts. Look for facts. Again, in emails, you need to be very, very precise. Uh, I'll show you how to. You know, I'm going to show you something so trivial that you're going to say, "Okay, Daryl, you, you know, we, we're not that dumb." But I'm going to show you how to structure an email. It's super important, um, especially in a in a negotiation. Another thing in an email negotiation is that sometimes we 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 start giving away things, and we don't even realize we're giving away something that's valuable. So we're not monetizing that and we're not asking for something back. So even in an email negotiation, you have to ask for something back. You need to make sure the other side actually gives you something. So, 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 so if you're willing to, to add on um, to, your enter, to your, I don't know, um, CSP, um, additional Azure um, spend, that's future spend, but you're willing now to um, commit to it, Make sure that you're getting something back in return and it's in the email and it's connected to that, what you've already given. And then if you're already bringing it forward, that Azure commitment or that, I don't know, you bring forward, maybe not an Azure commitment, but you're adding on a different, another um, 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 project that, that you weren't planning to migrate to Azure, maybe to AWS, and you're going to bring it into play, monetize it, put a number to it. This is worth to you, Microsoft, $100,000. Okay, what am I getting in return to $100,000? Not just my commitment, but to $100,000 worth of business. What's that worth? Get something back, monetize it, and then, and, then, and, and then you can really start seeing the value of what's going back and forth. Um, you need to, of course, agree on the time scale. Uh, very important. Again, as I pointed out, as you are waiting to get an email, maybe just put in an insert 
of when you expect of when you expect uh, to get a reply you should at the start of the negotiations in in an email put out describe the timeline and then each stage of the timeline again this is this will enable you to control the process it will put you in control in the driver's seat it will give you the ability to actually come back to them and ask them what's happening due to the agreed upon time time schedule not you coming back and oh I haven't heard from you yet. What's going on? So it's a completely different place to be. Uh, and I'm just, you know, before I move on, any questions just on the 12 rules of email negotiation? Yeah, we have one from Robert. Daryl, are you Please. proposing to extract the red lines into an email and address them line by line versus in the document that they affect? Excellent question. No, I'm not proposing that. I'm not proposing when you're going through a 20-30 page document that you need to red line words, especially legal. I'm talking, let's say, I would I would say this is the first stage of negotiations, the email negotiations. Before you're starting to red line the document, you're going through your requirements, you are starting to provide, they're starting to provide concessions. You've taken out, the, let's say, the top 10 issues in the contract that you want to first discuss before getting into the the details of of actually changing the uh, a, agreement so i would say this is a a stage before that definitely once you get to your redlining legally of course you need to track those changes and that's where you don't want to have multiple people again on an email so so if you have multiple people on an email conversation and i'll talk about that in a moment and that's pretty critical who's on cc who's on bcc who's joining that conversation and so on, um, um, you don't have multiple attachments and multiple people sending attachments with different red lines. So when you get to a red line, you need to also um, set expectations. Okay, I'm sending you the document. I expect to receive one copy back, not multiple copies from multiple people, each one outlining something. So it's your responsibility on the other side to aggregate everything Send it back to me and I'll aggregate on my side. So again, it's about setting expectations and the stage of the negotiation. Any other questions? Uh, no, really, just another comment from Robert. Uh, love the documentation of the give and take as connected events. Okay, thanks, sir, Robert. Okay, That's... so then so let's move on to the last um, 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 rule, the one of the, the uh, 12th rule. Just go back one second. I've got just one more rule. Sorry, and yeah, I, I was too fast. Um, this is really important. Don't assume anything. If you, if there's something that is misunderstood or you're confused about, the reply wasn't clear, don't try and interpret it. Very important. Ask a question. Ask for clarification. So if you're confused, don't just assume. I, I think that if I'm looking at the 12 rules that I've put together here, I would say this is the most important one. It's like having a conversation. How many times when you have a, a, a conversation with somebody, there's a communication breakdown? You, and that happens when you've got a face-to-face -face, uh, discussion going. In an email, things can go really bad because somebody thinks they understood something. The other side said something else. And you start moving forward and you come halfway through, almost to the end of the agreement, and then all of a sudden that one issue comes up. And you had a bad feeling, but you didn't want to ask because you didn't feel comfortable. So don't feel uncomfortable. Something's not 100% understood. Ask for clarification. There's no... Yeah, please clarify um, um, yeah. point number seven. Did you... Or, or I understood this and this and this. Is that what you meant? Ask the question. I think it's important. Otherwise, you're sitting there and guessing, and you never know what they actually meant, and that may derail the whole negotiation. You don't want to be frustrated. So I just, I just could not not put this message on screen, Daryl. So many flowers. <laughs> so many flowers. Thank you very much. I, I, I really appreciate it. I like flowers. No, me too. <laughs> I, also, I also really love flowers. Thank you. Okay. So then moving on, Alex. Okay, so let's talk about dealing with objections in emails. So, uh, as you can see, I like to put a lot of information on on my um, 
on my um, slides. So if you you can look, you can read through them slowly afterwards on YouTube. Some valuable information there as well. But let's just talk about dealing with um, objections. So I see objection ob objections as an opportunity to clarify and to understand the other side's needs. So. So, so we didn't even talk about the fundamentals of negotiation. So what is the fundamentals of negotiation? It's understanding the other side's needs. So when you get an objection, don't get, well, they're objecting to my request. Don't get all, don't put up your anxiety. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to understand what the other side really wants. That's the beauty of, of really reversing that. So if somebody brings up an objection, again, we're dealing with, again, let's take it to Microsoft, make it relevant. So if Microsoft, you, 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 you've asked for um, additional, um, um, I don't know, I've gone blank, um, ah, additional educational licenses for, to, to, to be added to your enterprise agreement at, at no fee. If I'm not mistaken, Alex, you get 10 20. licenses? You get 20. 20. Thank mm -hmm. you. So if you didn't know, you know now, you get 20 educational free licenses in your agreement. And just say you're asking for 100 and Microsoft comes back and says, no, we can't do that. Okay. What do you do next? Alex, what would you do next if they said no? Uh, well, I would have asked why. Uh, that, exactly. that, 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 because what? That, that, what was the reason why why can't you just give that concession? Because really, it's not it's not anyhow damaging to uh, to you if we use them properly according to the rules. Exactly, that's an easy concession. So I would go back and I would say this is an opportunity. Could you please elaborate to the reason? And I'm just talking why um, um, you are refusing to provide those additional licenses. Please keep in mind that we have. You know, and then just elaborate why you need that. And then you know, that's yeah. an opportunity. Explain. Or if Microsoft isn't providing you with an additional um, discount on your future true-ups. You've asked for a, a discount on your future true-ups. Year, year three, maybe. Because you know that you've got a plan and Microsoft refuses to provide a future discounts on true-ups. That's an opportunity to inquire to the reason behind that. Oh, now, yeah, well, Microsoft, that's a rabbit what hole. Is, what's <laughs> stopping you doing that? Just ask. They might come back and say, well, my manager said I can't provide it. They might come back mm. and say, well, um, no, we've never done that before. Okay, well, you've never done that before, so let's have a discussion. It's, 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 it's not a practice in our region. Okay, once you get that answer, you can actually say, oh, not in your region? Well, I know in another region it's possible. Can you please look into that? Mm. Use that as an opportunity to ask why. Let's move on. Yeah, I was I was so uh, taken by that your your monologue, so I forgot to move on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can we can we can get into mirroring as well and labeling in communications if you want as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe we'll have some time. So, okay. So, ah, first impressions is everything, even in email. It's not only this personal connection that you, that you make uh, when you meet face-to-face -face in an email as well. So, first of all, now let me just give you a story. Let me, um, I've got a short story to share with you. Back at my days at Microsoft, okay, so I'm an English speaker. I, might, I, was, I was born in South Africa. I lived... I live in Israel, I've studied abroad, I've, I've done business abroad, so, so my English is at a, I'll call it a decent a standard. And when I worked at Microsoft, I had a boss that um, his English wasn't top notch. And the amazing thing about him is that he, and he knew that, he recognized his weakness. And, he, and it was his first time with, in a global company. He came from local, from the local industry, and he moved into a global company, being Microsoft, and everything's in English, all correspondence and emails. When he started off, 
corresponding to his senior management, the first thing that he asked me is, Daryl, can you please review my emails? This is trust. First of all, this is trust. But I'm not talking about the trust. I'm talking about his ability to understand that the first impression that everybody is going to get when he starts sending out emails to people he's never met, not the people that hired him, that know his abilities and know his shortfalls maybe in English, but the people that don't know him, that, that have never met him, he wanted his first impression to be the best impression possible. So I sat with him on his first emails, helped him uh, build up his style, showed him some, some, some tricks of, 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 of the English language. And shortly afterwards, he actually took some English lessons, business English lessons on how to uh, articulate his ideas and his thoughts verbally and in email. So that's so powerful to my opinion. So if I'm talking to a global, global community now, some of you are native um, English speakers from the UK, from the US, others are from India, others are from Germany, Holland. Uh, uh, I don't know where else we have on the call today. So, so English might not be your native language. But it doesn't matter when an English speaker receives your email, that's their impression. I'm sorry to say that. Um, it's, just, it's just us being humans, okay? It's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a scratch in our, in our programming. So, so if you understand that, I highly recommend that you watch out for your style. There are multiple tools that, are, that, that you can use from, you know, and... You can use Grammarly and I don't know what else have I got you. Ginger software and God knows how many are uh, there, 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 there out there. So, so, so use a tool. Get help. Ask a peer to work with you. Really, really important stuff. Don't overlook it. Yeah, I can't, by the way, I cannot underestimate uh, the importance of such tools. Well, I, I'm not a native speaker. I was born in Russia, so I had to learn the language. <laughs> you and, correct uh, my, and you correct me on from time to time, don't you? <laughs> well, that, that's an interesting thing with, uh, with non-natives is then when you, when you really learn the language, you learn the grammar in a way that it then becomes... Uh, you see, the thing is, non-natives do not really think in that language. So we still translate. Even, even when I speak fluently, even when I uh, listen to you, there is a bit of translation going on anyway. And, yeah. and when it, it's almost like machine translation. Sure. Give a typo to Google. Google won't be able to translate it probably. Uh, same, same here. I see a typo and, and there's an alarm in my, in my mind go, go, going off, which may be, yeah. may be completely missed by a native speaker. But 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 I think I think in in that regard, somebody who knows the language well, but they they weren't born in that language, they probably will, will be even fussier about the grammar the, than than some of the natives, especially in the UK. You know, so uh, yeah, and and Grammarly is something I've just started using. So this is not sponsored. This is not sponsored. I'm just no 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 no. It's so, not sponsored. So, not sponsored. I, I mean, I mean, I, I wish. I mean, dear Grammarly, he hello. Uh, so, so I started using Grammarly, and and I can see how uh, even one or two mistakes in a th three thousand uh, uh, symbols LinkedIn post. If I correct them, I can see that the feedback from natives is much better. So and and when you when you when you negotiate, unless you're in a position of power, I think it's very important too. I agree you with know, that. I actually, I actually found a new tool uh, um, a, a few days ago. Really cool. It's Not called um, <laughs> Instatext IO. Instatext. Instatext. So look Does it up. It it does a pretty nice job. Um, for uh, formalizing. Um, emails or or any type of writing it's not perfect but again it just notches up your 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 level of um, of communication a bit so again there are, these are tools out there look for them there are dozens there i've got no preference you you use whatever you want but just make sure that you do use something if you have the need for it okay alex so let's look so let's move forward and when we're looking at an email structure, I know this is really basics. And you know, I've been told, Daryl, you shouldn't even have it here. You know, uh, but 
I still put it here just to make sure everybody yeah, is 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 aware of uh, I would call it the correct structure of an email. Uh, this isn't the only structure, of course. This is an example that I uh, put together, but you know, just just make it very professional, especially when you're looking at recipient's email address. So if you're talking about the formatting of an email, you need to keep in mind who's on the email. So let's just stop there a second on who's on CC. Um, who you putting on CC, and not only who you putting on CC, who is going to be added on during the process. So you need to go back each time that you receive an email and just look if anybody's been added by the other side. And then if somebody's been added, stop one second, look and try and look up who that person is. He might be somebody really important. You don't want to miss him. He might be a high up manager. He might be a technical decision maker. So this is actually another opportunity to engage somebody else or to be really careful or mindful, or maybe you need to bring in somebody else to the as a subject matter. If they brought in a subject matter, maybe a legal advisor, oh, okay, they brought in a legal advisor and they never told me, they just put him on as, as part of the email and then he starts corresponding with me. You need to look out for that. So there are, these are small things that can change the entire dynamics of, of the negotiation. And then, of course, the structure, the subject line, basics, get it right, greetings, opening line, body paragraphs, closing line. And I love to use bullets. So I don't like writing long emails or long articles. I'm not that type of person. I'm a bullet type of person. So I like keeping my emails or my correspondence really with short sentences. Again, it's your preference. But in email, there's email fatigue. So first of all, you always need to start off with what you want. Don't leave it to the end. Okay, people haven't got time anymore. <laughs> you start off with your main request at the top, and then you move on, bullet points, bullet points. And yes, if you do want to back it up with some scientific data or uh, market benchmark information, Gartner information, uh, and so on, then of course add on an attachment. But ag again, there are basic stuff. Refer to the attachment. Say that you've attached this attachment for the basis of uh, uh, um, um, market benchmarking information. So again, you need to make it very, very easy to follow, especially when you start um, sending back and forth re uh, negotiation requirements or asks or replies. Okay, basics, but get it right, please. So I'm using my um, Israeli type of move forward. Look at the Alex, because uh, I haven't got control. So this is <laughs> this is in this is in Hebrew. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> this okay, yeah, no, it, it's very important because you you you've come to the cultural differences, and I I love this slide. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna put ourselves on this side so people can yeah. try and so read Alex, this on their phone. This is, you know, this is fantastic because I've got the British here. I've, I, can, I, can, I can actually use you as my interpreter. because okay, So I'm a mix. I've got a culture mix. So I'm a bit messed up from that perspective because Me I was too. born and raised. I was born and raised in South Africa. I lived the majority of my life in Israel. I've learned abroad. Uh, I've done, I've been doing global business for the last 20 plus years. So I'm a bit messed up from a culture perspective. I don't even know exactly which culture I belong to. Uh, but but most people, are they're born in one place and they live in one country for their entire life. So they're very embedded in the culture. So I wanted to just show you how things can go really, really badly in an email. So I'm not going to go through all of these examples. I've just highlighted a few. So so for example, Alex, and now you now you you. You keep me honest. So, for yeah. example, if I would say to you, if you would say, oh, by the way, what actually do you, do you mean by that if you're being really British? Oh, by the way. Uh, it could be anything. It could, it, could, it, could really, it could really be very, very bad. So, so I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily think it's a bad thing, but I would expect it to be bad because uh, I, I've had this uh, many, many times here. Uh, my boss said, oh, by the way, Alex, I would, I would redo a couple of slides in your presentation. What he actually meant is rewrite it entirely. Take it and just write, a new, just, 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 you know, 
throw it away and write a new one. That that's what he meant. So by the way, it, it, could be, it could be disaster. It could be disaster. Well, so, can I tell can I tell another story if, if you yeah, don't mind? Yeah, absolutely. So 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 uh, I was I was a little bit concerned, and as a Russian, that means I was. A tiny bit concerned, a tiny bit, con- really. Don't don't misread me. Don't don't read between the lines. <laughs> and I sent an email to a British counterparty saying, "Guys, I'm a little bit concerned about this." They, I think, they escalated it to the CEO level. They came back and said, "What's going on?" <laughs> because I forgot that in the British culture, I am a little bit concerned. Uh, concerned means I think we're looking at a disaster. Yeah, we're looking at a disaster. So if I would have heard that. You little bit concerned? Okay, you little bit concerned. I would have taken it literally as it was said, mm. and that's a big thing in email conversations, because if you say something like that, the other side m- m- might not understand you. Because if I was an American, and you said, "Oh, by the way," then okay, this is important. I need to just listen to this. Okay, mm. this is not criticism coming up. This is something I need to just pay attention to, and. And you know, and if I would say, again, as as a as as a British, as a Brit, I would say, oh, hmm, that's very interesting. <laughs> potentially, potentially, and that's actually what happened in a conversation between Alex and I, and yeah. and a third party. I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before, and Alex was saying something that was very interesting about about I don't know a partnership or a product. Can't remember exactly what it was, and I was like telling Alex, "No, this is not. We don't do this. Okay, this is not something that we want to do. Um, potentially." Uh-huh. Well, Alex was being very British and saying, "Well, I really don't like it," and I was thinking, "Oh, he's actually interested in this," <laughs> and I and yeah. I was saying to myself, "No, no, 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 no. We don't. We don't do this." And Alex was saying the same thing. But I didn't understand it. British, I missed- yes, <laughs> I, I was I was very very Britishly saying no. Uh, yeah, I, I, there's a way of saying oh that's very interesting. <laughs> you see, the intonation <laughs> is very important. Oh, that's very interesting. That means like let's move on. It, <laughs> and I missed that. that. I should have hit that. But but then I, I was I was so embedded in the conversation that I that I that I am uh, met it. Uh, Flores so is you can't give you the well. Best. <laughs> well, Flores, I'll tell you a secret. I've been working with. Um, I had a Dutch partner that I'm sure you know, but I'm not going to mention him on the on the live uh, for almost I don't know twelve years. Yeah, yeah, going on twelve years. I had a Dutch partner, uh, and it took me a while, but I, it, after after three four years, I started to understand. The culture differences, uh, so 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 it really resonated. So again, we might all be speaking English. This is so important. We might all speak the same language, but we mean different things. So if we get back to the context of negotiations and Microsoft, and this is where it gets really really interesting, Alex. Uh, so yeah, be be careful with phrases like "what makes you think so" because you don't have to explain yourself. It means <laughs> You're an idiot. You're so, an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Br- Br- British culture is, is is difficult in that regard because probably uh, it, it all stems from trying not to offend the other party. So yeah. you have to read between the lines. But some people, uh, you, you actually have to read between the lines. And then in what you have deciphered, you need to read, read between the lines again. So in between the lines, that's an interesting statement. There's, there's, there's a phrase when you deal with um, China or Japan or other um, Eastern countries where mm. you need to read between the air because there it's so subtle you the mean there is no meaning to what is verbally said it is reading between is it reading Correct. between the air or oh, no sorry reading the air sorry the phrase is reading the air you need to Get the entire picture and you need to read the air of the conversation to understand what the other person is saying. So that is is so challenging. I don't know how many of the people on, on this call deal with, deal with China or with Japan. That is one of the most challenging communication gaps that there actually is. Uh, 
what did Flores say? That's why we, we don't work well with the Brits and Americans. It takes a lot of effort to understand the meaning. I love that one. I love well, that I have, one. Yeah. I have Culture to. Culture differences to, to make all the difference. Um, I have to admit, I had a Dutch neighbor, and she would normally come across as very rude, but she wasn't. She was just Dutch. And and and, sure. and my daughter lives. My daughter lives in the Netherlands, so I get. I understand the culture completely. And honestly, being a Russian, I do appreciate that much more than all those reasons between the uh, things. But I, because I was born in a, in a very direct culture yeah. as well. Yeah. So again, please pay attention. You'll, you'll never be able to learn everything, but just be aware. That, that's. That's something that's really important. So when you're dealing with somebody, um, if you're dealing with Microsoft, now we all know Microsoft is a U.S. Um, organization yeah. and very U.S. culture orientated. So I worked for Microsoft for six years, and I was a bit shocked. From um, I had a culture shock working for Microsoft because the Americans now it's completely different. Um, 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 how how the corporate culture works, how the organizational culture works. Uh, you need to learn it. Now, I'm not going get, to get into all the differences. We can we, we can have a full two hours if you want just on dealing with Americans. Nah, it's not about this. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. But what I want to say is that you need to just remember that if you, for example, are in the UK. No, let's take another example. You actually, let's use the Dutch, Flores. Let's use Flores' um, example. So you you are a procurement manager in 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 the Netherlands, and you're dealing. You think you're dealing with local Microsoft subsidiary, and you're dealing with a Dutch account manager or a Dutch executive, and you start getting various feedback and pushback and so on, and 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 you speak the same language. You just need to keep in mind you're actually not dealing with a Dutch. You're dealing with a local subsidiary that is part of a global American culture-based company. So they are talking to somebody in the U.S. And their executive team might be actually sitting in the U.S. or or, or the uh, um, 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 country manager might be, not might be, he might he's reporting to somebody in the U.S. And that culture comes all the way down from the top and funnels all the way down to the last subsidiary. So even the subsidiaries, especially, Sorry, especially people that have been working at Microsoft for many years. That's why it's important to look at the LinkedIn bio of, of who you're working with directly at Microsoft to see his tenure. Has he been working there for one year or for 10 years? Has he done a tenure in the US, in the UK, in Germany? Because that will give you an understanding how entrenched he is within the culture. And if you understand that you're actually dealing with somebody local, but it's very much American, stop to think, and then just do a bit of homework on American culture and adapt yourself. Okay. Now this Shall is my side. Move on. Yes. Move on. Okay. So I just wanted to say something here about the importance of time and power of patience. You need to be really patient when it comes to email negotiations. Really patient. Because of this asynchronic type of back and forth, Things take time. You need to understand the culture, how they respond, the hierarchy of the organization. You can actually, you don't have to guess it. You can ask at the start of the negotiations, what's the process? How many people have to review this? So on and so on. So patience in a negotiation, I think is one of the most important virtues that you can bring to the table. Patience, don't rush it. Breathe deeply or... Um, deep breathly when you get when you don't get a response. Deep breathly when you get a response and you don't like the response. I would say don't even breathe. Don't even take ten minutes. Take a full day to respond. You need mm. to posture yourself because otherwise that's going to get through very very aggressively as we spoke at the beginning. I, somebody taught me never never respond to emails late at night or you know during the night. Just just let them sit there, they read them, close them, let them sit there, wake up, and then respond. Yeah, I made that mistake yesterday. I'll share a personal story. I won't get into details. I was having I'm on a WhatsApp group of an, a number of individuals locally in Israel, nothing to do with business, and it got personal. Mm. 
And I told myself, don't look at the next email, at the next WhatsApp um, in an instant message. Leave it till tomorrow morning. And I was already tired. It was half past 10 in the evening. And I told myself, Daryl, you know this. Don't look at that email. And I'm experienced already. I teach negotiations and I negotiate. I still looked at that um, instant message and I replied immediately because I got so angry. It was then I, in the morning when I woke up, I knew it was a mistake. Then I knew it was a mistake when I looked at it. So now I can only tell you that, and, I, and I'm sharing this personal experience because we, we all do it. Avoid it. <laughs> really avoid it. Don't do that. Yeah. Uh, by the way, about patience, because can I, I, I'm connecting this to one of your first slides when you were talking mm -hmm. about the 12 rules uh, of email negotiations. And, and when you said uh, something about be patient, uh, they can, they can, you know, take weeks to respond. And that's, by the way, that's what's happening with uh, one of our negotiations right now. They're very slow to respond, but, but the responses are always very good. So I stopped worrying finally, <laughs> but, but when, unless I'm play unless I am playing a game of uh, silence, which is a power a powerful tool, as we've learned from one of your other presentations. Uh, I usually, when I understand that I haven't got time or there's something that you know may prevent me from answering quickly or I need to, some time to think, I usually, when I receive an email, I send an acknowledgement back myself. As, as I said, unless I'm playing a game of silence, I said something about something like, uh, thank you, I received it. I need some time to read it and I'll respond to you in a couple of weeks. So then, then the other party doesn't really sit there uh, in a, uh, anxiously and, and thinking what's going on. And I also make myself more comfortable because I'm not getting all those idiotic chasers. You know, like, Alex, have you looked at my email? And by the way, you know, you have, I've sent, uh, the, you know, kind reminder, gentle reminder, gentle nudge. I don't need all that spam in my inbox. So <laughs> I don't need to be uh, alarmed by every time that something else pops up. So, so I create myself that uh, level of comfort by... Uh, by that little cultural thing in an email just to say, thank you, I'm acknowledging the reception, but I'm unable to respond right now, so please, please, please give me, please, please bear with me, please, please give me a few days, a couple of weeks, and yeah. I'll come back to you. That's a good point. Helps with negotiations, by the way. <laughs> it does. Hey, it, 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 it does, Alex. It does. Okay. So, do we want to move on? Yeah, you've got control. Yeah. Okay, so moving on, moving from email to phone negotiations. So, you know, people always ask me, when do you know that it's time to move on? You know, if this is like a step-by-step process, it, it normally isn't. It's a bit of a mix. But, but, but just say, you know, there's a question. When do I move on to a phone conversation? So, first of all, you know, I've got some, um, I'd call it tips. So one is, if, you, if it's a long-term relationship, I would say jump on the phone. There's nothing like personal connection. Don't, don't get blocked down with emails if it's a long-time relationship. Start off with an email if it's a new, if it's a renewal or something. But try get on the phone just to break that business kind of very uh, tight relationship. That's one. Um, Uh, what? Are, uh, sorry, I lost my. I lost my conf uh, my um, concentration. I distracted you with the. I distracted you with the caption. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I lost my concentration. Sorry. So um, another, another, another point is if you've hit a hard, a hard stop in the negoti in the in the email negotiation. If you feel something's not working, the response time is too long. Uh, you're hitting a hard wall. Too many people are jumping on CC all of a sudden. Something in the tone is changed. Don't wait, okay? Don't wait and make it and, and let it escalate and, 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 and get out of proportion. Move very quickly to a phone call. Initiate that phone call. Be the one to ask for that. It will sa save a huge amount of effort. I know that many people these days feel more comfortable behind a, um, a, um, a screen, uh, not a screen, a... Um, Ah, uh, no, what's this? What do you call that, no? Um, keyboard. <laughs> a keyboard, thank you, Alex. So people feel comfortable behind the keyboard. They don't want to expose themselves. I don't know why. That's because I love talking. But no, actually, I know why. Sorry, that's not true. I understand, I understand that apprehension of jumping on a call. People hate talking on the phone these days. People hate 
even being on Zoom, it's much more comfortable. It's safe. You're in your safe zone. Get out of your safe zone. Move out there. Get on the phone. And especially when you hit a culture gap um, and, and there's misunderstanding going on, jump on a call. Mm. <laughs> so important. If there's misinterpretation, misinterpretation going on because of culture differences, get on a call. These are some, are some tips. If you recognize them, these are cues, move on to the next step. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, I, I think Any you questions have... uh, before I uh, take a deep dive into um, the no, ABCs? There were... We just had a comment from Sam, which is related to a couple of slides back. Starting up with the main request at the beginning is very important. I've had meetings where I had decided to wait until the end and never got the opportunity to communicate my question entirely. That's so important. Always start off with the most important things, to my opinion. Again, in an email, just get it out there. Otherwise, you might lose out on it. Um, again, this is about putting together your entire strategy. You, can, you should always list all of your asks for yourself first and then categorize them. And then you need to think about, okay, when, when do I want to bring them up? Which one in what sequence? What's going to come over by, by, via email? What's going to come over via call or video conference? And it's also a bit of playing some tactics. There might be some easy concessions that you want to give away at the beginning just to build the relationship, build rapport, and you want to leave the hard things for the end. Um, you, you need to strategize and then really categorize. Really, really important. Okay. Uh, uh, just any one, other questions? One, yeah, very quick from Flores. What if the other party doesn't want to get on the phone? What I would actually do, Flores, I would ask why not. I would actually try and understand, and I'd be very politically correct about it, find the right tone of voice. Um, it might be, it might be um, stage fright, moving out of their um, um, comfort zone. It might be a culture thing. Their Maybe their English, their verbal English isn't that good. I've met people that can communicate really well by email, but because of um, a very um, deep accent, people can't understand them. They've, they're just very apprehensive jumping on a call. So don't jump to any conclusions. Don't be offended. That's, that's, that's super important. You can ask why. Mm. People will usually tell you why they're I, not jumping on a call. I can add to that. So some people these days don't like jumping on the call because they see it as a time waster. Uh, actually, when we started working from home, suddenly we actually have much more time because we don't have to travel. Now we now now we value that time even more because of that. Now we can, you, you can do eight meetings when before you could do only maybe a couple a day because you had to travel, you had to drive, you had to find a parking, you had to you had to, you know you, you you could have missed a train or something like that. Yeah. And and now we value our time. And now when somebody tries to jump in and we already have eight calls. I don't have time for just a call. So one of the reasons if the other party may not be willing to get on the phone is just because you didn't explain why. I would actually start with, uh, okay, guys, I think we've hit the, we've hit the, uh, uh, like, like, like a um, uh, dead end in this conversation or the list of, uh, the list of, uh, misunderstandings is, is a bit too long. So let's jump on the call and discuss this, 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 this and that. So so my tactics is to send an email with a clearly outlined agenda. And even sometimes, when if, if I'm happy to uh, disclose uh, my, my position, what I want from them, I would even give suggestions of how I want this to be resolved. And and then it's easier to because because, because they can prepare for the call. Uh, they can probably, if, if they're not natives, they can prepare the wording. So I, I, I make it easier for them and make it easier for myself as well. So I don't get that pushback. You know, if somebody sends me a, a, a LinkedIn message now and, and say, oh, Alex, by the way, we have this fantastic proposition. Let's jump on the call. I respond with what proposition? 
can you please explain why I need to spend 30 minutes on the call with you? I, I'd like to understand that. I'd like to be prepared. And, and maybe I will refuse right now. Why would we even waste time jumping on the call? You won't sell it to me anyway if I don't like it. So, so, so that, that sort of thing. So maybe, maybe, you know, maybe they don't want to jump on the call, not only because they, they're comfortable talking, but maybe it's also because they just want to understand why you want it. I totally agree. So we're going to talk about it a second. That's, that's an excellent point, Alex. Um, having an agenda and why you want the call and how the call is structured. So, oh, yeah, you so, have a slide so, about that. So let's just that. look at what I call the ABCs. Sorry, no, sorry, I'll, I'll come second, back. Alex. No, no, that was, that was accidental. Okay. No, I, th I thought you were checking to see if I was alert. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so then the ABCs are voice negotiation. Um, again, these are the basics, but I've been burnt so many times <laughs> with this stuff that, I, that again, I just, I, just, I just have to talk about them. So again, verify you have both the voice over IP and, li and landline option. My, just my pr um, preference to have both options if possible. Um, if, if you're providing a dialing for another country because there's really a bad, bad internet connection there for whatever reason could be countries that maybe or areas that aren't that developed and I've negotiated really around the globe in areas where internet wasn't that, that good, especially in um, areas in Asia and in Africa. So again, depending where you're negotiating, just make sure you've got a local number that they can dial in. These are the basics again. Um, major countries, a 1-800 number, if possible, again, if you're using landline. Some old school, but still sometimes important. Meeting code. Okay, security, security, security. You don't want anybody that shouldn't be there jumping on the call. Or you don't want um, 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 the other side um, bringing anybody that they want into the call without be, being able to, for you being able to identify them. So uh, what I've done in the past, I've come on as a shadow negotiator. So a customer brings me in, not in the past, I still do it today. A customer brings me in. They don't want um, for me to be um, part of the negotiation team for many different reasons, but, but, but I'm managing the negotiation from behind, and I want to join the call. I want to listen into the call. Now, if there is no login PIN number, if there's you no, know, I, can, I can just join in anonymously, then... Now, fantastic for me, but the other side has got no login, got no security credentials, nothing. So again, you want to make sure that your line is secure. You want to know who's joining and you want to make sure that um, um, you are controlling the environment. Time zone mistakes, I'll go through that again mm. and again and again. I've seen it so many times. Calculating time zone mistakes, time zones, multiple geographies, just in the U.S., there are, keep me honest here, the U.S. guys, there's one, two, three, four time zones, correct? It's not five. Five? Can, do we have anyone still here? Anyone on, uh, can just help uh, us? Sam, I think there's four. Yeah, Sam is in the States, so uh, there's a bit of a 20-second delay between the so, comments and not so, seeing them. So I'm saying four. Samuel. Alex is saying five. Time zones just in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Okay, they, so we'll come back to nine. that. There used to be nine in Russia. <laughs> used to be nine in Russia. So I'm just yeah. talking about that's a country. I'm not even talking about um, <laughs> globally. So so again, I've I've made mistakes. I've jumped on calls in the middle of the night with the wrong hours. Uh, you know, all this crazy stuff. Uh, it's not fun because you're preparing and you're bringing in people and they're coordinating and then you get the time zone messed up. Mm -hmm. The basics get the fundamentals right. Now, if you're recording the call, or planning to record the call, don't do it without the other side's approval. Please don't. You're going to ruin it. If it does come out, or if they ask you and you fumble with your answer, you have killed your credibility. It's not worth it. If you want to have a record of the call for both sides, then start off and say, is it okay with you that we record the call five time zones oh including alaska and hawaii thank you I, mm -hmm. That's thank you for that, um 
So, so you need to make sure that the other side consents to recording the call and then share that with them. Okay. Otherwise, you're going to lose credibility. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Let's move on. So, call location, the basic stuff um, that we've all been living with for the last, I don't know, 18 months plus. If it's at home, where are you at home? Uh, it's not a usual conversation because this is a negotiation. Make sure you get a closed door, lock the door. For example, so I've got an outside office at home. I lock the door. Otherwise, I'm going to, I've got four kids and they just walk in. Oops. Sorry. Uh, they just walk in. They don't care. Oh, they just stand and start knocking. You know, we've, we've all gone through this in the last 18 plus year, uh, months. Hope not 18 plus years. Um, so just make sure we're at home, that everything's set up. Nobody's going to disturb you. Lock the door. Close the door. Put a notice out. Um, use a landline if you've got internet problems. Or even have a backup. Uh, I've, don't know, we, don't know, we, even though I live in a Western country where internet, I would say, is pretty good, but internet falls sometimes. So mm. I always have a backup. I either have my mobile phone that I can use or I have a landline as well. I always have a backup so I, can, so I don't lose time. There's six time zones in the U.S. <laughs> wow. Okay, this, is getting, this is even getting too complex for me, but thank you, Omer. Uh, uh, pretty, pretty crazy stuff. So it's, so it's really relevant to watch out for time zones, especially with multiple parties joining one negotiation. Sam PM, thank you for being with us. You know, very wow, nice. wow, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty late. Okay, so looking at the next slide, Alex. Yeah, setting the agenda. Yeah. Uh, yeah, setting the agenda. So Alex pointed this out initially. So you might think that having a voice call is just having a voice call, a voice call like having, I don't know, somebody present to you a product or discussing something with a friend. No, this is not the same. You need to have a structured agenda just if you're meeting face to face. And you need to start out setting that agenda in an email, of course, no other way to do it. Set it up, send it to the other side, get them to approve it, get everything communicated, make sure that the agenda includes stuff like introduction, scheduling, timing, uh, topics for discussion, and maybe you've already had a discussion or you've already emailed and you've agreed upon um, so, um, um a number of issues. Make sure that's in the summary as well. So we've already discussed these and these issues. This is what's been discussed. This is what's been agreed upon. These are items that are still open. And this is what I want to discuss going forward into the next meeting. And um, please, um, I'm going to be having this and this um, individual from my team joining. Um, and you can absolutely just discuss who they are. So there's no surprises as well. And also talk about who's going to be taking minutes. Is it your responsibility? You'll be sending out the minutes. Minutes are very important so people don't. So there's, again, not a break in communication. Or are they going to taking minutes? Or are they going to take minutes? So set that agenda before a voice call. Always be very um, careful if a vendor calls you at your office, calls you on your mobile, and you're in the middle of something, and the reseller, your reseller calls you, uh, I don't know, and you're in the middle of negotiations with him and they, and he just starts negotiating. You like pick up the phone and he starts negotiating. Stop. Immediately stop. If that happens, you are not prepared mentally, psychologically. Um, um, you're not there. Even if you know the material, the material, stop. Don't take a, a don't pick up the phone to my Oracle or SAP or Adobe or to your reseller and start discussing something that you haven't planned for. Be polite. Say, I don't have, uh, I don't know, I don't have time at this moment. Um, let's schedule a call for, let's set an agenda. Take this seriously. This is like any other negotiation. Set an agenda. Don't just jump into it. Okay, moving on. So multi-party calls, 
calls are no longer no longer simple. <laughs> the days of just having one person on the line, and I think Alex and I are old enough. <laughs> I don't mm-hmm. know um, who else is on the call today, but I think we're both old enough. We both hit 50 this year. Uh, I hit 50 last year, actually. Um, that we remember when a call was a call, one person on the line, just to bring in somebody else was like high-tech uh, 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 capabilities. Today, almost all calls are multi-party, multi, multi-party calls. So you need to agree in advance, first of all, with your team internally. So there are two sides to this. It's your team and their team. Never forget, this is, this, this is actually some of the basics of negotiation for preparing. You prepare everything on your side, and you prepare everything on their side. So you need to take into consideration who is your team, and you need to take into consideration who is their team. So whatever I'm saying about your team, a lot of it is about getting that background intelligence. That's super important to the success of a negotiation. So when you have a multi-party call, you need to agree on a, on a, on a number of things. First of all, with your team, Who's going to be participating? Who's going to talk? Who's going to lead the uh, discussions? Introductions. Role plays. If you want to maybe have some kind of role play going on. The simplest example, but they're much more sophisticated, is bad cop, good cop. Mm -hmm. You can play that role play, but you need to set that up in advance. Who's going to be taking minutes? Oh, yes. And of course, what are the objectives? Um, Who's going to be speaking first? And if I want somebody else to speak, if I'm the team lead and I'm from a Middle Eastern culture, everybody's going to be talking together. Big mess. So I want to prepare my team in advance that they will only, please don't, talk only if I address a a question to you. I want to control the sequence. I want to control who answers what question. It's super important. And you don't want to come through if I've got a Middle East culture where everybody just talks and interrupts each other and I'm having a meeting with um, Americans and Americans, I love the way they construct calls. It's so structured. Nobody talks out of place. Everybody waits till the other person finishes. Very polite, very businesslike. Not everybody's like the Americans. You need it. It takes a bit getting used to. I like it very much. I use it as well. But I didn't come from that culture twenty years ago. Mm. I I can tell you that in 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 England, uh, sometimes in some conversations, if you don't jump in and interrupt, they will never let you say anything because because what i find is uh even in business negotiations if uh if we don't talk and i already say we because i've been living here for so long we're a bit we're a bit scared (laughs) (laughs) tension it comes Mm -hmm. back to what i spoke about the virtue of patience in negotiations it's so powerful especially in, 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 in a call where there's an, a multiple number of participants on their side and on our side. And it also just makes the process much easier, especially when you've got um, on Microsoft side um, your um, account manager or a, a, a account team lead, and then you've got a licensing executive and you have some and a business desk manager and maybe you have some product team people on the call as well. Yeah, uh, mm. this is this is some difficult stuff to um, uh, um, um, manage. So you need to have mm-hmm. everything well structured, have the agenda, know who the people are, and then just just be a team lead, manage the team. Okay. So let's look at some key stages in the phone negotiation. So again, um, this is the way that I like to construct the call. Introduce your team members. Listen actively. Don't get overexcited with when a point is. Agreed. There's like a tendency when 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 somebody agrees to one of your asks, like 
Oh, fantastic. Well, ha, that's great. Let's, okay. No. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's just note that that point has been agreed upon and we will summarize it at the end. Don't show too much excitement. No, no. Slowly, slowly. Uh, don't commit too fast. There's a tendency to try and, well, there are get personality the, get the headache, types. Get the headache off, isn't it? Yeah, there are personality types that just want to get through this, <laughs> that just wants this to be done. And then you, want, you, you are too quick to commit. This is right to any, even to, um, to, 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 to phone, face-to-face -face or video conferencing. People are over enthusiastic to commit to something. Don't. Take a deep breath. Write it down. Nothing ever happened if you came back with an answer 24 hours later. Use silence, long pauses and breaks. Very powerful. If something, if tempers start to rise, and you can hear it in the tone of voice, we all know it, okay? You can really hear what goes on just by the tone of voice. And if the tone of voice starts going up and, and tension starts growing and people start losing their temper, you can hear it in the tone of voice. It really comes through. Listen. Your eyes are not working here. You're losing a lot of your senses. So, again, one of the most powerful techniques in phone negotiations, well, in negotiations in general, but in phone specifically, is to use silence. Use long breaks. People hate silence. If you go silent on something because somebody has lost their temper and starts on a rampage, I can promise you they will stop and they will lower their tone of voice. It's a technique that works time and time again. Very powerful. Try it. And of course, at the end of any phone call, don't just say thank you very much. Bye-bye. We'll talk in a week. Summarize. Go through what's agreed on. Go through action items and talk about the next steps. Thanks. <laughs> One of the things that is important on a phone negotiation because it can get pretty messy at, at times is set small and achievable goals. Don't try and get everything done in one call. Don't throw everything out there. I'm not talking about what's important and what's not. I'm talking about small achievable goals. Make sure that both sides feel that this is moving forward. Again, small and achievable goals. And then you've got a number of rounds of negotiation. Start accumulating wins. Start accumulating small wins. Small wins each round accumulate to a huge success at the end. So be strategic and plan it in advance. Plan what you want to achieve just to make sure that you're getting, that there's a process, that there's, that there's forward motion. There's, there's a lot of power when you negotiate with forward motion. Things are moving forward. Look, things will move backwards as well. But try not to move two steps backwards. Always try to move one step forward. And if you're feeling that you're entering a spiral, and make sure the spiral is not a loop, that it's a forward spiral. Very important in the, in the, in the, in the, in the energy that's, that's built. So nine key tactics and negotiating out of, over the phone. I'm going to go through them quickly. Don't multitask because you're going to lose your... Um, the other side is actually going to notice. If you're multitasking, that's not showing um, 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 respect. So if somebody is multitasking, the other side will know about it. And that's losing rapport. That's losing credibility. Um, take notes. Use pauses, silence to think. As I said, set small goals for each call. Document, use minutes and send them out. Build the relationship through rapport. I know people are getting tired of all these calls and all the small talk, but when you're building <laughs> up a large 
agreement either with a new vendor or if you knew and this is an old vendor, you still need to build rapport. You still need to build the personal relationship. Don't forget that. Forward motion. Always keep moving forward. Even if it's small wins, make sure there's a win that you come out with uh, um, for every round. It's important for morale. It's important for confidence for yourself and for the other side as well. Um, get approval where you need approval and always set next steps. Never leave a call and say, thank you very much. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Set the next steps, action items. Can I say something here about the small talk? So so what, what I noticed, again, it's it's more of a British thing here because we, we never had it in Russia. So you would ask you know, somebody, how are you? They would say, fine, maybe share a couple of news, but it usually takes like five minutes. I've been into uh, negotiations here in the UK when uh, small talk would take 40 minutes and then the actual conversation would, would only take 10 but then the parties are already comfortable talking to each other. Yeah. They're comfortable either agreeing on the result of this particular step or maybe uh, you know, with what they're going to move on. It, it really is, is important. And, and that actually taught me not to interrupt the small talk unless, unless I can, unless there's somebody I know and I just say, sorry, I, I need to rush. Can we just move on to, to, to the subject? If it's somebody new, if I'm building a rapport, I would leave it as long as it needed to be. Uh, you also have to feel like if, if you if you are not tiring the other party with your small talk, that's that could be the other side, the 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 uh, the flip, you know, the, the flip side of the coin. But yeah, interesting stuff. As I said, that's the culture minutes. stuff, Alex. You spoke about culture now. That's so important yeah. to understand if you're dealing with um, um, uh, a British counterpart or American counterpart or or a German or. Uh, you need to just, uh, again, just Google it up. Just look, mm -hmm. there's so much information. Just look about small, small talk with Americans at the start of a meeting. You'll get exactly a checklist of what to do. Now, that's powerful stuff if you're prepared for that. And it's so simple. It's awareness. You don't need to be a culture expert. You mm -hmm. need to be an expert at knowing what to look for. That's the big difference. Brilliant. So we're going. We're getting on to the video calls now. Yeah. So moving on to video conference again. There are differences. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the differences from face to face, Alex. Mm. Moving forward. So let's understand that. To the next slide. So one of the big differences is that you feel that they can't see you, but it's actually it's not that that it's not personal. Um. So, yes, you are losing a lot of the body language and that personal connection and the vibe and reading the air. That gets lost. But at the same time, there's still a lot going on. And because we've got Zoom fatigue, we're <laughs> actually not paying attention to some really important nuances of body language that are still there. So, yeah. yes, we've lost a lot of that proximity and we've lost that vibe in the air and we're not that attentive because we're not meeting them in person. But at the same time, if you start looking at the subtle movements, so some subtle movements could be just peep, somebody showing boredom and they're just looking down like this. Just watch out for some cues, <laughs> small cues. <laughs> You'll notice them very carefully. You don't need to be a body language expert. You've got your gut feeling. But just look out for, you know, if somebody just starts sitting like this or like nodding their head or like looking away. You know, some basic, basic cues. They're still there. So we're losing a lot, but there's still a lot to see there. And then be attentive. And then if you see something happening, from a body language perspective or somebody getting really bored with this meeting and starting to sit back like this and turning around and yeah, you need to address that. <laughs> you need to address that. So let's talk about some of the basics, getting it right. Um, so everything that I mentioned in email and everything that I mentioned in the, in the voice call is, 
is 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 relevant for um, uh, uh, video conferencing. Let them see you. It's so important. Oh yeah. Let them see you. Make sure. And I know everybody's an expert today on Zoom and uh, and on Teams. So I don't want to. Don't know, I'm not going to get into the um, basics. But position your camera at at your heads at head level. Don't have the camera like this. Sorry, all the way down here, seeing half your body. I don't know, like this, or the camera, or vice versa, like this. Yeah, this yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Or or the like I'm, people, I'm, yeah. <laughs> people put it like all the way like this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you saw my car, my car um, collection at the back. I love old cars. So 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 position it in a way that it feels more personal. That they can see your hands, you know. So you've got some body language going. It makes it a bit more interesting. Um, you know, you can make it personal. I love to know. I've got my family over here. Okay, I like to make it personal because otherwise, uh, it's boring. It. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so I like to know. I can, I can, I can show you around my room if you know next time. <laughs> it's a bit of a mess, but um, uh, through around my office. So. So yeah, make sure the camera's right. Um, Alex taught me something really important. Cost me a bit of money, but thank you, Alex. I invested in a good mic. I was oh, using yeah. my, my, mostly I was using my uh, desktop, not my desktop, my laptop, sorry. And occasionally I would have my earphones. And then Alex said the most important thing on a live or communicating is the quality of your voice. And the worst thing that can happen is that people can't understand you and can't hear you. So I invested. Make sure that your company invests in you or you personally invest. Okay, Super important. It's even worse if you've got bad speakers and you can't hear the other side and you're battling to understand because you've got bad quality speakers from your laptop. Keep that in mind. Basics, but really important. Um, I always say treat the call as a face-to-face. -face. So even though it's not a face-to-face, -face, we've discussed why it isn't. And, well, well we know why it isn't. It's still a face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. Let's keep it personal. Let's make things a bit more... Let's build the rapport. Build, have a good communication going on. Important. Uh, we have a question yeah. from Floris. Would you would would you mind taking it? Because it's it's yeah, a good always, one. Always. Because, because you, you you both used to work for Microsoft, so you probably can take my this condolences, one. Floris, that you had the same experience. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I had a I I I, I had a good tenure That's at Microsoft. Great experience. With Microsoft, you can always take as many notes as you want. Then when you ask to confirm the minutes, Microsoft does not want to co <laughs> comment on things said, commitments made. How do you handle that? Yeah, so Microsoft are <laughs> that's a that's that's a that's a great point. So Microsoft, if they don't get their business desk approval on something or legal approval on anything that's been agreed upon, they won't send it to you because they feel that it's that it's being that it's that um, they are to committing to something that hasn't been approved by the hierarchy of the company. So so what I do. Again, you might do something else. What I personally do is I send out my minutes of the um, call. I don't even want their agreement. <laughs> don't send me an approval. But I will send out a summary of what I understood was agreed upon. And if they don't get back to me and say something like, no, we didn't agree, I don't want approval, then I'm going to take that to the word and I'll push them really, really hard moving forward. So that's, that's my tactic. It's not in stone. I agree. It's not in stone as you would like it to be. But it's still getting some kind of, I would call it, silent approval to what was agreed upon. Not ideal, but that's as good as it's going to get with Microsoft. Uh, sorry, I I was okay, another question. I was intending to hide it. That's that's it. It was just a just a thank you from uh, Marisol. Yeah, I'm glad that you're learning from this. Really, really, yeah, you know, yeah. so happy to this share. 
So one last point on this, just one last point on this slide is try and meet them with the same number of people that they have on their side oh, yeah. on your side as well. So if you're in a conference room and they got like four people there in the conference room and everybody's got something to say and they got legal and they got finance and they've got a product manager, make sure you have the same number of people on your side. It, otherwise, it can get really tiring. You make mistakes. You get caught off guard. Uh, there are many reasons mm. why not. It's the same for face-to-face uh, -face negotiations. I won't get into that now. But just keep in mind, make sure that you know how many people on their side are joining and try and equalize it on your side. Let's move on. Okay, so again, this is basics, basics, basics. Summarize, just like in an email. So send out an email. This is the same for a voice call, date of meeting, participants, topics discussed, items agreed upon, open items for discussion, action items, and next scheduled call. Again, these are the basics, but there's so much going on. And I always say, if something's not agreed upon, really agreed upon, it's not agreed upon. And if they don't agree to something, the other side, then I wouldn't commit either. I would leave it to the end. Then I always have a phrase, if somebody's asking me to commit, well, can I take that as a commitment? And I'm still waiting for some, something from this. And I would say, you have my general consent on that, but let's get back to that towards the end of this round and we will review it once we review all other open issues. So don't be, don't rush into consenting and don't commit without making sure the other side hasn't committed and brought something as well. Really important um, um, in, an, um, in an offline negotiation scene, uh, scenario. Let's move on. So we're, coming, so we're coming close to the end. Time zones I've discussed. Same here. Don't forget them. Pay attention. We understand how important it is. I've got a, I, I, I've actually, I want to share with you a tactic. It's a dirty tactic. It's okay. used against me. So I learn from the best. I've been, people have scheduled negotiation calls with me and they know where I am positioned. Um, if I've been in the US or I've been in Israel or I've been in the UK, I've always had the pleasure of traveling. People have knowingly scheduled a meeting that's very convenient for them. Could be Pacific time or mountain time in the US. Mountain time, if I'm not mistaken, it's minus 10 from where I am. And they set a call for like 3 o'clock my time, 3 a.m. And I like stupid enough to wake up. You know, you're not at your best at 3 a.m. doesn't matter how good a negotiator you are or experienced. You're not at your best. And you jump on a call at 3 a.m. And, and you're going to miss something. Now, if somebody does that to you and you fall into that trap because you want to be polite, uh, you want to accommodate because they say, well, we can't bring this executive to the call. We only have a slot from him at this and this time and it falls like at 3 a.m. Reciprocity. So when you have that, you come back to them next time and you need to bring in your executive. <laughs> you make sure that it's set for like 4 a.m. their time and you say, well, I'm sorry, but my executive is traveling and he can only find a slot at this time and this time. They'll understand the message. So watch out for that. Sometimes it's just really because there's no other ch choice. But very experienced negotiators will use any tactic to get an advantage. So look out for that advantage play if it comes your way. That is a dirty trick. Uh, I, would, dirty I, trick. Uh, that's, I wouldn't you, do it to anybody, only if it's done to me. Yeah, I've only, I've only uh, agreed to calls when it was quite late here, say nine, 10, 10 
uh, p.m., but only because the other party's time was something like 7 a.m. So it was uh, equally inconvenient to both parties. That is something I would totally agree upon. But if somebody tries to inconvenience me and I feel it, I, I just won't go on the call. No matter what sort of money we're talking about. <laughs> just be aware of that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, dress code is sometimes overlooked. It's sometimes overlooked. You feel as good as you dress. That's not my phrase. You look, you feel, sorry, you feel, and your attitude changes depending on how you dress. Mm -hmm. Now, again, going back to COVID and fatigue of calls, video calls, people just jump on calls like they are sitting and watching TV at the end of the day. It's not the same for a negotiation. It's not only about respecting the other side. It's about your self-confidence and your stature. Your stature completely changes when you have a jacket on or when you don't have a jacket on. I'm not going to undress now. It changes. It changes. So if I walk in to a presentation and... You know, I could be sitting with a jacket and with my slippers on or bare feet. I'm not. Okay. <laughs> I put on my dress shoes. Okay. Funny I'm not enough, doing that. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not <laughs> trying to show you my, my, my uh, boots. But mm -hmm. the reason that I'm doing it, because it changes my attitude. I come with a different energy level. And that mm -hmm. energy level comes through. And that shows confidence. It's so important. I can't tell you how important it is. And I can't tell you how many people are missing on it today because they're tired. You don't miss on it. You dress for the occasion. I'm not, not don't come with a tie. Okay. But button shirt, jacket if needed, and don't and don't have shorts on underneath. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because you'll feel it. And it will come through. It doesn't matter what. It will come through. That's 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 what I'm saying. That's my own take on that. Can I? And I'm not a big. Okay, I'm not. You, know, you won't find them suit in my closet. Can I add but, something to this? I I think you also it, need to consider the the culture as well. So so what sort of culture you're talking to? Because Americans are much more relaxed in regards to semi casual, or what they call it, like smart casual. British are. Even working from home are much more formal. So, so to be honest, well, how I'm dressed right now is I'm overdressed actually for a, for a British uh, conversation because because normally indoors it would be just a shirt or a shirt or a tie, and a tie yeah. but not a jacket. And if you put, but if you put a tie on, and 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 you you even in England, if you go on a conversation, if it's not with a you know with the Queen, and you have a tie on, and you you you're fully buttoned up, and and, and you wear it jacket that could come across as either you are uh, arrogant or the flip side of that not confident enough mm -hmm. so so i would i would say consider consider the cultural uh uh nuances because because when i when i talk to the majority of mediterranean uh people and customers I'm much more relaxed in that, in that regard. I could could be wearing a, a t-shirt as long as it's not it doesn't have any offensive words on it. I, I wouldn't be much worried about how I come across because well, it's it's pretty warm in Cyprus <laughs> and in Israel. That's that's true. But for example, if you're negotiating with um, somebody from Kuwait or from Dubai or from the United Emirates, mm -hmm. uh, the Arabs are very conscious. Of how they dress, they 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 are very meticulous, very meticulous, mm -hmm. and you need to show them the same respect. So again, you you mentioned a good example: Cyprus, Middle East. Middle East is a very big geography, big area. very mm -hmm. big um, area, and and I totally agree with you, Alex, when you say there's culture differences, and yeah, I don't want to point out how many times have we gone back to culture, how many people. I don't know, before this call, actually thought about culture as one of the key attributes when they negotiate. And if you haven't, this is a really important takeaway. The culture issue. We, have, we, have, yeah, we, have, uh, we have a presentation about 
cultural uh, negotiations. Is it, is it in a couple of weeks? No, no. First, uh, so eighth of eighth of September is SPLA, but yeah. then uh, plus fourteen was it twenty second of September? I think. I so. think we, we have a live exactly at the same time. You can check it on some experts page on LinkedIn. We have all the events uh, listed there. Also, if you just subscribe on YouTube, just go to upcoming lives and you'll see there it's already scheduled. And I think it's 22nd of September. We're going to have uh, another Daryl's show, which will be about uh, cultural considerations. Oh, we've talked about it quite a lot today as well. Yeah, but there's a lot more that, I want, that I'm going to cover in a couple, in two hours, yeah. Mm. So let's just, um, I'm going to summarize some key takeaways. So again, I'm coming back to conceding remotely. Well, it's, it's, it's really harder to concede remotely than front to front because you feel like you're giving away something. So really be careful about conceding, giving away what you receive and so on. Uh, there are some, I'll call it, um, some, there's some stress about that because you really, if you're giving away something and you can't read the other person's body language, you can't see his note taking or something like that and you don't know who the, who the decision makers are, or you haven't mapped out the decision makers, you need to be careful with what you concede and what you give away. You need to plan thoroughly. I would even say you need to plan more for a video negotiation or remote negotiation than for a front-to-front -front negotiation because everything is recorded. Um, you don't have that much time. People haven't got the patience to go on over time. Especially, for example, if you've traveled to somebody's premises and it's a face-to-face -face and you've put in the effort, that other person will give you an extra couple of hours because they know you've put in the effort. Over a video conference, people are back-to-back. -back. They've got schedules minute-to-minute. -minute. So you need to really plan thoroughly and plan your schedule. We spoke about using an agenda. We covered briefly team preparation briefing your team, bring them up to speed, making sure everybody knows their place uh, and how the call is going to be um, conducted. Do a review. We didn't talk about in this presentation about um, an MDO and an LDO. So an MDO is your most desirable outcome. An LDO is your least desirable outcome. Basically, those are the parameters of um, negotiating um, according to the fundamentals of preparation. I cover that in like the 101. So, 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 so you need to plan ahead what your concession strategy is going to be. What are you basically going to give away for what and when? And then what are your barriers of that? So don't just um, go at it and draw from the waste like okay now i'm going to give this oh now i'm going to give this oh now i'm going to, no <laughs> you need to have your legal pad at least what i use and i have everything articulated i put everything in writing so i don't lose track of what i wanted to achieve how much i wanted to achieve and what i wanted to receive in return don't forget something for something. If I give something, same in a face-to-face -face negotiation, this hasn't changed, same fundamentals, you want to get something in return. I always try that if I give something, um, if I give better terms. So for example, um, if I'm negotiating with my reseller now, um, and we're talking about payment terms, net 30, net 45, net 60, or I don't whatever the terms are in your country, um, or um, currency conversion rates, I would monetize that. So if they're asking for net 15 and I want to and 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 I wanted to get net 30 or net 45, that's worth money. So mm -hmm. monetize that. So if you're going to concede and give another 30 days of, of um, improve the, your payment terms by 30 days, you can say, okay, that's worth to me 
in a $1 million deal, those 30 days based on what I earn my interest rate, oh, I've just given you $12,000 or $15,000 or I don't know, whatever that is. Okay, that's worth something. What can I get in return for fifteen or twelve thousand mm. dollars? Monetize, turn that into dollars. Turn every concession into dollars. That also makes it easy to start comparing stuff. Decision makers. This is a big mistake that 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 I've seen time after time. Even in face to face, but actually, because it's not face to face, people get confused a bit. There are decision makers in the process. And you must probably not talking to the decision maker. That's always my default. And if you're not talking to the decision maker, you need to make sure you understand and know who the decision maker is. You need to understand what stage of the negotiation you're going to see or hear or get feedback from the decision maker. You need to strategize on your concession list what you're going to be giving to who and when. So don't make that mistake of assuming because this is just over Zoom that it's a different ball game and it's like all, okay, let's just get the deal done. No, there's decision makers, there's shadow negotiators, there are consultants, there are influencers, mm. influencers. There's the whole teams there in the back end. Um, avoid getting lost on one subject, basic negotiation. Uh, and use and use silence again. <laughs> yeah, on the video silence call, you do it very, very, very well. Much better than on the phone call because you can sit there and stare. I'll do this. Just go silent. Very powerful, isn't it? It's so powerful. Yeah. It's so powerful. And I would say that is, you know, I keep coming back to that, especially in this type of media. Silence and patience. Very, very powerful tactics. May, may I ask you about the decision makers? So, uh, because because yeah. with video and phone calls, you have an ability to, well, you don't waste time on travel and you, you're you not that impacted. But by one of the dirty tactics that I, I had used against me, when I thought I was still in Moscow and in Moscow to get somewhere during the rush hour, that's two to three hours. Uh, and and I, I thought I'm meeting a CEO or a decision maker, somebody C-level. Yeah. And and that it was confirmed. Uh, we, we, ha we had a previous agreement that there's going to be a meeting in which we're going to be discussing the, uh, the deal. And I come there and understand they did it on purpose. There's there uh, some, not even mid-level manager, low-level manager, who apologizes and says, "I'm oh, sorry, you know, the CIO had a had a had an urgent call and they had to go to, to the board meeting, but 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 don't worry, I, I'm going to talk to you." And I realized they have they they were given a certain agenda, and they they they're making this impression that they cannot negotiate it with me. Well, they cannot because they weren't given the power. And and when you when you in such a, when you've already invested two three hours in this and you sit in there. Sometimes you may be inclined to just, you know, just say, right, like, okay, let's move on. Let's just go with what you want and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll fix it later. But I think, but it, correct me if I'm wrong, do you have, do, uh, when it's a phone call, when it's a video call, yeah. is it different? Because because you, do, you you haven't invested that much. You're not that upset. You're not that tied to that. So so what, what would your suggestion would be in, in this case? If, they, if, if, if you understand that's a the tactics they're using, they just didn't come on the call and they dropped some people that are less, less relevant. Uh, in, in many cases, there's a purpose behind it. So actually, that's, that's, that, that's a very good point, Alex. So, so I would say that it's actually, there's, there's a benefit to having it by a um, video conference or, or phone call. And if they neglected to, to, to invite the decision maker, I wouldn't continue the call. I'd be very polite about it because you're not wait, you haven't wasted any travel time, as you said. You haven't driven there. You haven't flown over. I would say, oh, oh that's fine. No problem. Um, let's just please reschedule because as mm -hmm. we discussed, it's really important to have the decision manager, the decision maker on the call now. now. You've lost nothing. And then you've really put them in a tough spot. 
Or another tactic many times is that they might say to you, well, I can't take that decision. I, I need my managers or my directors or the business desk approval on that subject. I would say, excellent. What an opportunity that we're on a video conference. You know, I'm going to take a five minute break to get a cup of coffee. Maybe you can try and bring them on the call. Yeah, that's a nice one. Yeah. Okay? That's an because they always use that. It's always used by salespeople. <laughs> well, it's used by procurement as well, but 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 more by salespeople that they haven't got approval and they need approval. And you know, I've played that game multiple times. I can I can give you so many examples of of how I've played that card. And um, mm. um, it's actually a, it's it's actually more difficult to play when you're on a video conference. You can always come back and say, well, if um, this and this decision maker couldn't find the time to join the call, I understand that this subject is not very important to you. Oh, no, 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 it's very important. That's but powerful. I understand that he had other priorities. No, 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 you're, you, you, you're very important to us. Well, okay, if it's such a high priority, then we can reschedule. I've got time. Turn it around. <laughs> Okay. Indeed, Turn it indeed, indeed. And by the way, by the way, speaking of uh, importance, uh, we have an interesting question from Samantha here. What Samantha. if Microsoft shows up in a gown on Teams? Ha has it happened to you, Samantha? Can you please share? <laughs> I wonder. I'm wondering now why you're asking because because how you worded that. I I read between the lines like Microsoft. Uh, had an opportunity to offend you with, with doing that. Yeah, I'd love to hear your your experience because that, were you offended by that? Or were you laughing? <laughs> it, 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 uh, I, you know, with all due respect, if, even if even if they were my friends, but I would be discussing business with them. I wouldn't, I, I, I would not be offended, but I would start questioning. <laughs> I, would, I would definitely, you know, I would actually, I'll tell you what I would do. Okay. Mm. I can be a bit ruthless I, if I need to. Okay? Mm. I'm a nice guy, but I can be ruthless. Yeah, you are. Uh, thank you. I'm ruthless. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. Truthfully, what, what, what I would do if, you know, if, first of all, I would be offended. Truthfully, I would be offended mm -hmm. if somebody comes like that to a, a meeting. And I would make, I would turn that to my advantage. If I want to receive something really important to me during that call, I would point that out in a very subtle way. I would make a joke about it. I would make them feel uncomfortable sitting there in order to push them to give me what I want because they offended me. It's, 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 it's basically repositioning the entire call. Make them feel uncomfortable that they actually owe you something because they offended you. So okay, you can do it very, you know, not everybody will take my approach, but I, I personally, I take personal offense if somebody comes like that to a negotiation because they're not investing the time, the effort that's needed, they are not showing me respect. Okay? This is about yeah. business. This is not us, my best friend, and we're having coffee, and, and we haven't met in a while, so it's not the same. But I would add to that, don't show them that you're offended. Just use it to your advantage. Don't, don't I mean, no, I, would, no. I, would, I, would, I would have a pocket face. I would even start, you know... This is a British way of, of, of things. Yeah, I, I would be a tongue in cheek, like, "Oh, sorry, I've, I've woken you up," <laughs> something like that. You know? <laughs> Are you having a bad day? I like oh, sorry, that one. I like yeah. that one. Oh, I saw that you. I, 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 I can see that you have enough time these days to take an afternoon um, nap. Good one. Oh, Good what? One. Then I, I can, then I can go and what? The kids kept you up the, the whole night. You didn't have a chance to. Mm. Dress before I call, you know. 
there are many yeah. ways to sh play to play this play to your advantage We've uh, actually reached the end of uh, today's session. So if, if you have to rush, uh, thank you for being here by all means. If you want to ask a few, maybe just one question, because I think Daryl can only take one and we'll let Daryl yeah, to go. Yeah, hard stop coming up. Yeah, yeah, yeah to, to go to your uh, family celebration. I'm not disclosing the details. So any, if anyone wants to say anything, uh, ask anything, and uh, well, the, uh, you know, I, I can't, I can't not not put this on screen. Uh, so if you have any questions about Microsoft licensing or negotiations with Microsoft, because this is half of the business that this company is doing, if not actually more than half, uh, ask at someexpert.com uh, by all means. With any questions, I will keep it private. Uh, we can schedule a call. Uh, we, we, can, we can talk you through your headaches and there are many people we just help by, you know, just they just jump on call. Uh, we give them a quick advice, they go away and fix it. We, we don't charge for that. But if you want to do business, of course, that's what we do. Uh, Samantha just said that, yes, I, I guess that was the answer to uh, has it happened to you? Ah, it was an experience, yes. <laughs> it was an quite experience. an experience, I would say, in, in, in a British manner. I wish so. maybe if you've got it. Then I, I don't know if you've got it uh, recorded. <laughs> love you. I'd love. To, I'd love if you could share it. <laughs> I love. <laughs> yeah, that's what you do. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, you didn't. You didn't. You didn't tell us if they are your friends because maybe that that was the, <sighs> that was the thing. Anyway, so. Uh, again, thanks very much, uh, everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, and uh, if you want to rewatch this, as usual, we keep the recording on the channel. Please click like if you're still here with us, because I would appreciate it and Dara would appreciate it. Other people, if you click like, YouTube promotes it to other people. Other people will find it, watch it, learn something. Uh, maybe your friends, bring a friend, you know, tell a friend. Uh, don't forget about the next training session, free Microsoft training session. We're going to be talking about Azure and Office 365 on the 1st of September. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, Flores. Uh, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for coming, Sam. Thanks, and guys. Right. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.